This is going to be a pretty in-depth tutorial, but with a pretty cool end product. Basically, the idea is to pick a small section of a Minecraft world and have the blocks in that section sent to a device that will make an open sim, which will recreate the blocks there, essentially linking an area between the two virtual worlds. We'll achieve this by first writing a short program in Java that will access the block data and save it out to a text file that we can then import into OpenSim to recreate the blocks in there. Don't worry if you don't understand the code. This is not a tutorial for Java, obviously, so I'm going to post the code online, and you can uh, just copy and paste it and just change a few lines of code here and there, and it should work in your setup just fine. In the ideal setup that I'll be using, I have a multiplayer Minecraft server running on the same machine as a web server, so I'll have a small PHP script, which when you access it, will run the Java program and update the block data and send it out to whatever accesses it. Um, the OpenSim script will access this web address every 20 seconds or so to get the block data and make a pretty much live recreation of that part of the Minecraft world in OpenSim. If you don't have a setup this nice, you can adapt the instructions to use a single player Minecraft game and then just manually copy and paste the block data into the OpenSim script. It won't be live, but it will be a lot simpler. Alright, let's get started. First, we need to pick out a section of the Minecraft world that we plan to monitor, and then we'll mark it off and put something interesting inside to clone over to OpenSim. So, I'm going to be joining my multiplayer server, but like I said, a uh, single player should work just as well. So, to keep things simple, we're just going to be using an area right next to the origin, because that'll make it a whole lot simpler later on when we go into the Java program. To get to the origin, uh, press F3 to pull up the coordinates and then follow those to the X, X and Z coordinates 0, 0. Um, if you notice, um, Minecraft uses the Y axis for its vertical axis, but OpenSim uses the Z axis for its vertical axis, so we'll have to take that into account later. Alright, so now um, we're at the origin, we need to pick a vertical slice, and the vertical slice needs to be um, visible evenly by 16, because Minecraft stores everything in chunks of 16. I'm going to go down to 64, which is a nice, simple, evenly divisible level. Okay, so we actually don't want to go all the way down to 64, because the blocks at the 64 level, like these blocks right here, these are actually going to be like the floor underneath the section that we're going to use. Because if you think about it, um, it breaks up into sections of 16, so these blocks right here are the top of the fourth section up from the bottom. So um, right here at block 65, this is the first layer of the fifth section, and that's what we're going to be focusing on. So now I'm going to uh, clear out an area here that it, um, we don't want to have a very big area or we'd lag open sim completely to death. So what we're going to do is just mark off a section that's 10 by 10 wide and 8 tall. The very first block in the chunk will be at the coordinates 0, 65, 0. So I'm going to go ahead and mark that off right now with something... Now I'm going to go stick this sponge at 0, 65, 0. Alright, so this sponge right here is the very first block in the chunk that we're going to be monitoring. So now um, I'm going to put a, a box around the whole section that uh, we're actually going to monitor. I'm going to mark that off with lime wool. This box, it's not going to be inside the area, it's going to just barely mark the border of the area. So the area is actually going to be over here, because, no wait, it's going to be over here, this is our our positive uh, quadrant over here. So our border will start right like this, and extend out for um, the border will actually, since it since it's outside the box, the box will extend eight up, and the uh, the border itself will actually be ten high and twelve wide on each side to contain the ten by ten by eight tall uh, area. So I'm going to go ahead and clear this area out and put the border in place. Okay, now after that hasty excavation job. There's now a section that's totally clean, nothing is inside this border, and, except for the sponge, which I'm going to get rid of now. Now, inside here, we're going to build a structure that we're going to use to clone over to OpenSim. So, we're not going to deal with all the blocks, that'd be too ridiculous. So we're just going to be using the blocks air, stone, grass, dirt, cobblestone, wood, sand, and gravel. So now I'm going to build a structure in here that uses only those materials. 
Alright, so now we have a structure that's made up of all the blocks. That's all the stuff we need. So, uh, now, so now we can quit and go write the Java program and get the stuff rolling. Okay, so now we're going to write a program in Java that will use a library that I downloaded from Mojang to uh, read the Minecraft file from the disk and then parse the data in there and spit it out into a text file that, that we can then put into OpenSim. I'm going to post this code online so you don't have to write all this yourself and uh, all you have to do is edit the, file, the line right here that says where the region file is and right here is where the file output where the output file goes to. So you can see it's in my public HTML directory so we can access it from the web. So let's just walk through the code here real quick and show how everything works. You can see up here um, in importing uh, the Mojang libraries that allow me to read the level files. And then um, this is just declaring some static stuff up here. And down here is where the main starts. So first we um, open the file um, at the chunk position that we specified up there, which is 0, 0 in our case. And then we're going to read that chunk into memory, and then close the file. So now we have this object. The object right here that's called a compound tag. It's a chunk. And that contains a huge vertical column, 16 by 16, of everything in the world, um, from the bedrock up to the sky, in that chunk. So now we need to extract the vertical section that we want. So we extract section number 5, so we have the static we have a variable here, section number, because we declared that we want... Actually, it's section number 4, because you start counting from 0. So right here is where we said section number 4. It can, corresponds to the fifth chunk up, which would start with Y position 65, which is what we've already marked off in Minecraft. So um, we are going to get the compound tag section right here for that fifth chunk up. And then inside there, we can get a byte array called blocks and that's what we've been looking for is the actual block data in raw binary form right here and now we're going to iterate through this and find the block types that we want so we're going to iterate through over x uh, z and y and then we're going to get block id at this address right here this is this crazy addressing scheme that i looked up on it's on the minecraft wiki actually i think where this is the formula that it uses to access inside this big block, inside this big binary array, where the um, where each block is at. So here's all the different block types. We want to say if it's if it's air, stone, grass, if it's any of those, then we're going to add to this big string that we're building here called output string. It's going to be in the form of it says up here in this comment in the form x z y block id. Notice that we're doing it out of order. We're putting z in the place where y should be because um, when OpenSim reads this, it's going in to interpret it as X, Y, Z. So we're switching the Z and the Y, since um, OpenSim and Minecraft treat those oppositely. And then after that is the block ID. And the block ID is, a, is the numbers that we defined up here that will define these same numbers in our OpenSim script in a very similar way. So those numbers determine what that block type is. So we just build our string here and then add a new line at the end of it after each block and then we output it to the file down here. If you have any basic understanding of Java, this should be very, very simple. And even if you've never written Java in your entire life, you should be able to just edit these file paths up here. I'm pretty sure on Windows it stores these under C, Users, then your username, then there's a hidden folder called App Data, and inside there is .minecraft, and inside there is Saves, and then the name of your world, and then Region. So. It's a pretty long file path, but it's not that hard to find if you know your way around your computer. Get this Java program saved, and then we're going to compile it. Let me. Of course, you um, most of you probably will not be doing this from a Linux command line. Most of you, uh, you can do this in Eclipse or NetBeans, any Java IDE that you want. Um, but since my web server is going to be the thing running it, I figured I might as well go ahead and write it on it and make sure that it can run on it. So we'll compile that and we'll run it to make sure it works and you can see now there's output.txt it was actually already there because I cheated and did this before I recorded but now let's look at output.txt and as you can see it's just every single block position and what block ID is at that position counting all the way up through X, Y, and Z covering every single position so anyway uh, there's your output file that's what's going to we're going to access on the web so 
you can see if I were to go to this is the address of my web server. There we go. So this is what our open sim script is going to read and where it's going to get its data from online. Uh, what, what I'm going to do to make this even fancier is instead of having output.txt accessing here, we'll have like an output.php, which will be a PHP script that will run this Java program automatically every time you access it so you get a live updating view. All right, so here is the magical, super, super simple PHP script that will handle our output. Basically, all it does is tell PHP to run Java, with the MC2OS program, and then echo the output to the web browser. So if we were to go and look at that, it would look like we browse to output.php, because that's where I saved it. I saved it onto my Windows share that goes to the file server. And then it looks like a big, crazy, jumbled output. That's because our browser is expecting HTML, and it needs uh, special HTML line break codes at the end of each line that this does not have. So, see, if we view the page source, we can tell it is still broken up line by line. It's just the browser doesn't like to display it correctly. So, our open sim script will read that output, no problem. All right, now we're going to do the actual building in OpenSim. Um, I'm stuck as a girl here because this is a fresh installation of OpenSim. I haven't had any other player models installed, but anyway, let's uh, we'll start out with a block, as always. All right, now we're, we want to make this one by one by one meter, because this is going to be the first block in our... Uh, set up and I'm gonna put this at a nice round coordinates just cuz makes stuff easier All right, so no. and for, we're gonna make it phantom the whole thing's gonna be phantom and uh, the texture we're gonna set it to blank and so here we go here's our first block now we're actually going to make all the blocks that are ever going to exist and then we're just going to ch be changing their texture and their uh, opacity, so that's how we're going to give them the appearance of resing and unresing. They're not actually going to res and derez. So now we're going to uh, copy this out, and I'm going to rename this to be just block, so that um, all the ones that are cloned out after this will also be named block. So I'm going to make another copy of that. We're going to go ahead and edit the position and set them to round consecutive positions one meter apart from each other. I'm going to go ahead and make five of these. And then after I have five, I'm going to select all of them, link them, and then now I'm going to copy the whole conglomerate over, and then round off its position also to make it nice and precise. So now I'm going to link this one to this one. And now we have a big row of 10 blocks linked together and now we can take this and make 10 in the other direction. Just repeat the same step by copying them over and changing the Y values this time. Make them nice round values. Do it all the way until you have 10 of them across. Alright, so now we have the entire bottom row here and one thing that I neglected to mention is you want to make sure that your root prim, the yellow one, it's always the last one you link, becomes the root prim. It has to be the one in the smallest X and Y position, since that's our first one. So like, if you look at the red arrows here, um, the, the blocks propagate out from it in the direction of the red and out from it in the direction of the green, and they're going to also come up out from it in the direction of the blue. We want to make sure that the root prim of this whole block, when we're done with it, is the one in the very bottom corner down here. So now I'm going to clone these up and make eight of them high. Alright, so here is our big giant 10 by 10 by 8 cube. And now we can go ahead and rename the root prim to Minecraft Box version 4.0 or whatever name you want to do it. And uh, when we do that, it will the rest of them will still be named block. The root prim now has a different name. It is called Minecraft Box. So it's a nice name for us to refer to it as. And now we're going to enclose this whole thing in some walls just to make it look nice. Take this right here. We'll rename this wall real flat in the Y direction here. 0 0.01. And then we'll make it as tall as our box, 8 meters high and 10 meters long. And let's give it a blank texture. Now let's bring it all the way down to 25% transparent. So we can, no, 75% transparent is what I meant, yes. Now let's align this wall here. I'm just going to kind of eyeball it at first, and then I'll go and 
adjust the values to make them precise. Uh, oh wait, we're actually, I think we're going to have to put these at 0.5 values. So 174.5, 38.5, 39.5, 35 35.5. So now this wall is nicely lined up over here. Now we can clone this wall over to the other side. So we're going to repeat that same process over here to line our wall up on this end. And now we're going to clone it out to the sides. And you can hold down control and then we're going to rotate it, adjust it onto this wall. Okay, so here's our box entirely encased in walls. Before we link all these walls to the innards, what we're going to do is make them all transparent. That's what we want them to be by default. So let's uh, move inside there. You can use Alt to move your view around like that. And now we're going to set the texture of all the blocks inside here to the transparent texture. We don't actually want to set them 100% transparent because the script is not going to change the alpha values. We're going to do the default transparent texture here. We're actually going to use the transparent texture itself to make these invisible. So it'll take a sec here for it to become all transparent. Okay. Okay, now we're going to select all the walls. And then move our view inside. Select the inside. Okay. So now the whole thing's selected. See, we, we clicked on the inside last, so that way when we hit link, that inside block right there will become the root brim. And there we go. It's all linked. So the next thing we're going to do to this is add some buttons to the box. It's going to have a power button to turn it on and off with. The entire time it's on, it will automatically refresh the contents of the box every 20 seconds. And it's going to have a reset button clear the entire contents of the inside of the box. Power button. That's important because the script later on is going to refer to it by its name power button. And then we'll make the texture blank. And we'll make the color red for off by default. Alright, so we're going to make it real flat. It's going to be 0 0.01. And uh, the other sizes are just fine. And now I'm just going to kind of eyeball it here and move it up real close. So uh, that's the power button. Now for the reset button we'll just clone this right on over and we'll change the color to blue and then we'll change its name to reset button select both of these then select our box and link them to the box so now the physical setup of our whole box is ready and we're ready to put a script inside it to make this thing come alive alright so I'm gonna walk through the script here um, I am going to post the script online just because it's a huge, enormous script and it would be terrible to have to type all of it in, but I do not recommend that you just copy and paste the entire thing verbatim, because you really need to, uh, this is the important part of the tutorial, of course, because this is an open sim tutorial, so the scripting is an important part. So um, I recommend you could copy and paste it in chunks, but as long as you understand everything is the, I'll, I'll try my best to explain it. So up here is a whole bunch of utility functions right here that do various things. I'll explain them when, we, when when they're called. And up here is just some static stuff that's declared, constants and globals. We have a, uh, here's all the blocks, same ones we defined in Java. And um, here's a, a lookup table that we're going to use to address where all the blocks are at. And here's integers. These will be like pointers to the link numbers for the power button and the reset button. And then this integer right here, I'm really using it like a boolean and it'll set the um, the busy state so whenever the busy state is set it will um, it will not refresh and try to have two refresh operations going on at once because the refresh operation can take up to about 16 or more seconds especially if the server is busy and this last const uh, this last global we have up here is the HTTP request ID this is uh, it's part of how OpenSim handles um, doing HTTP requests, so I'll explain that when we get to it. So down here in the main, uh, first it just shouts out initializing so people don't think it's dead because this part can take a while. And first thing it does is it um, it just adds uh, the root prim to our, our two tables here. Block position, that table is a table of vectors, I mean a list of vectors. And since our first block is going to be the zero position, we can just use the uh, predefined constant zero vector, because that's where it's at. Below that, it, the block num list, that's a list of the link numbers. So for all the, like, the index values, the 
correspond between the two lists. One is the vector of where the block is at, and the other one is the link number of that block. So right here, um, we're going to parse through all the linked prims. So it gets the total number of prims, and then here's a for loop right here that iterates through all the different uh, prims, and then it, it gets the name. So if the name is equal to block, then that then uh, since all of them besides the root prim that are blocks are named block, then uh, we're going to add it to the tables. So how we do that to get the position is first we call um, this get link primitive params and get the position. The reason we do that instead of I'm pretty sure there is a function called get link position, but that introduces a 0.2 second delay which we do not want. But get link primitive params introduces no delay. So um, we, we get its position, and then we subtract it from the position of the root prim. This right here returns the position of the root prim. That means we get basically an offset value here. Um, and this actually returns a list, so that's why we have list to vector, to extract that vector out for its position of this current block. And then we add its position to the, the table of vectors, and then add its length number to the table of length numbers. And right here, once it gets across the power button and the reset button, it will set the respective pointer values to the, the link number for the power button and the reset button and this sets the power button to yellow I have it changing the power button to yellow every time it's doing something busy so that you you know that it's it's busy to not touch it when the power button turns yellow and then after this it goes right into the state off so we have an on state and an off state I'm actually gonna skip down to the bottom to show the off state first it's the simplest um, whenever it's in the off state, it just sits dormant. All the blocks inside it don't change, they just sit the way they currently are. So when we go into the off state, first the box is going to say off, and then it's going to set the power button to red. And then, um, it's all, the only thing it's doing while it's in the off state is waiting for a touch. And when it gets touched, if it's the power button, it will turn to the state on, and if it's the reset button, then it will clear out all the blocks. And before we do the clear blocks operation, we do set busy, and then clear busy off. I have a clear busy off and a and a clear busy on because at the end of each um, operation it has to either set it to red or green. So I have two operations, one for a red button at the end and one for a green button at the end. So you can see them right here. Here's our three operations for set busy, clear busy on, and clear busy off. They're both real simple. All they do is set the busy flag and they change the color of the power button. And see, we say if link is reset button and not busy, because we don't want to have this happen twice. Right here is, this is our magic part right here, and not busy, because we don't want anything to happen if it's busy. We want it to be completely unresponsive while it's in the busy state. So um, up here is our state on. So we just pretend we just turned the box on, and what it's going to do is it's going to say on, set the power button to green, and then it's going to set a timer event here for every 20 seconds. and uh, the timer event is, is declared down here, we'll get to that in a second, and it says immediately after you set the timer, we're going to do our first request right now, otherwise it would have to wait for the entire 20 seconds first. So if it's not busy, then we're going to set the HTTP request ID equal to um, the return value of this function LLHTTP request. Uh, this is actually a old value right here, I'm going to update this to where my new thing is with the dot. PHP and it's in a completely different place and stuff, but um, you, you'll set this to wherever your file is hosted at. Now, of course, if, you, if you're not if you're not actually hosting it somewhere, you uh, just kind of look at the script and you can do a ton of simplification because you can eliminate the whole timer and HTTP response and just set it all equal to a big flat string. So what you can do, because uh, I'll, I'll explain that more in depth when it gets to the part where it actually uses the string that it retrieves. So, okay, down here is the timer event. This gets called every 20 seconds. Now, if it's not busy, if our, so that means if the last operation has already finished, then we're going to do this exact same thing. These lines should be the same. This is only up here. See, it's, it's an exact direct copy of the, if the, of the timer event because we just want it to, to happen once um, right after we set the timer instead of waiting 20 seconds. So... Um, what it does is, when it does the HTTP request, this will return immediately. And then whenever the HTTP actually makes it to the script, then it will call the HTTP response method. And then um, with this key called request ID, showing this is the request that I'm responding to. So we want to make sure it's our request that it's responding to, the same one that we set up here. 
and if so, then we're going to set busy, because we're about to do the big refresh operation. So it's going to say refreshing, and then it's going to, um, here it's, it's getting the, the entire body, body right here, this is the, this is what it retrieves from the web server, this is going to be our big string that the, the Java program spit out, with all the XYZ positions and the block IDs. So it's going to split this by new lines, that means each line is going to be split onto a different part of this list, and it's going to get the length here so we can iterate over each line. So now, um, we're going to uh, grab out of that array just one line right here, so uh, the current in that we're at, because we're iterating through this, we're going to pull that out, this is the current line that we're on, and then we're going to split that up into parts. We're going to separate it by a space here. So now we have a list of the X, first is X, then Y, then Z, then the block ID. So now our target, um, it, has to, it has to start out as something, so that's why I'm setting it to zero vector first, because then we're going to set each individual component of it. So each component of a vector is a float value, so we're casting this to a float, because it comes out as a string from the web server. So we're going to just get the, the X, the Y, and the Z. So it starts counting at zero, and we're just going to get each part out of that and assign it to X, Y, Z. And then we're going to make a call to set block ID to the, the fourth part here, part three, because we're counting from zero. So uh, and we're going to cast that to an integer, because this um, the set block ID method, it asks for a target vector for which block am I going to do this to, and then a block ID. So, and then when that's done, it just clears the busy state. So now I'm going to come up and explain the real meat of the whole thing, which is set block num id method right here that does this complicated stuff. And I, I'm not sure if I ever got around to explaining these. What, what these do is um, they're just lookup functions. We can get a link number if we give this a position, and this will give us a, we can set a block id by a position. So this lets us set block ID by position or set block ID by link number. And see, these kind of chain together. If you call this one, it'll just look up automatically and then call this function down here. So anyway, this function right here is really the meat of the whole program. So um, what it does is, it says if the ID, it checks these constants right here that we set, whatever you set the ID to, it's going to set the texture with the LL set link primitive params fast function we're going to set the texture to right here. This is the UUID of the texture we want to use. So what I did is I went into OpenSim and went browse through this texture library. And in Imprudence, you can right click on the texture and hit copy UUID. And it'll copy that to the clipboard. So then I came in here and pasted that in for each of the different textures that I liked. Um, this air texture right here is actually a texture called transparent. And then um, down here, this is a nice looking stone texture that I found, grass texture, dirt texture, cobblestone, wood, and the only one that I couldn't find a, a good replacement for is the sand texture. So I actually went online and found a sand texture, and then I uploaded it to OpenSim, and you drag this into the inventory of the object. So when you, when you call it by a name, it looks inside the object's own inventory for a texture named sand, and it'll apply that texture. So that's really all it does. So uh, just read through this carefully and uh, get a good understanding. Copy and paste it in sections. Try to get one section working at a time. Start out just making the box turn on and off and move up from there. Just try to wrap your head around this script. And if you can really understand the elements of this script, then this is pretty much as advanced as OpenSim scripting really gets. So I apologize for not giving you a real thorough description of how to write the entire script, but I just figured it's such a, such a very large script that for the sake of time constraints, it's easier to just post the entire file online and let you do a little bit of independent study going through it and figuring out how the script ticks. So now I'm going to go put this script into the box in OpenSim and, let, and we'll see it in action. Alright, so let's test this out. I'm going to turn on the box in OpenSim. And there we go, it's loading up our structure over here in Minecraft. Now we're going to make some changes. And here it is just updated with the changes we just made. So we can turn it off and clear it.
thank you for sitting through my excruciatingly long tutorial, everybody.